welcome to EPG Patshala. The unit you are going to listen to now is a unit of the module Advanced Syntax. Allow me to introduce myself. I am Professor Jayashiran. I taught syntax at the English and Foreign Languages University Hyderabad for several years. This is a sequel to an earlier unit on the same topic, namely the theory of government and binding. This is the second unit in it, of the, on the same topic. Let me refresh your memory. In that unit, we outlined a, a development in Chomsky and linguistics called the theory of government and binding, which succeeded and superseded the earlier formulation of transformation grammar. And what the theory of government and, government and binding did, we often refer to this theory as GB. What GB did was to maximally simplify the form of grammar and we showed how in the first unit we showed how the traditional rules of grammar were eliminated in favor of a very simple general rule move alpha Traditional grammar, as you know, had several different rules of grammar called passive, question formation, relativization, comparative formation, clefting, topicalization, etc. All, each one of those rules was different from the others. And moreover, the rules were formulated differently from language to language. And this, we said, presented a learning problem, acquisition problem for the human child. If this were the shape of grammar, this would make it impossible for the child to learn the grammar of its mother tongue in, a short, in the short span in which it actually does learn this. Therefore, the attempt of Chomsky and linguistics was to simplify grammar. And what Chomsky did in GB was to replace all the traditional rules of grammar with one rule, move alpha, which was extremely general and which applied across all languages. And move alpha says that move anything, any phrase, from anywhere to anywhere. And then we said that this creates, generates a whole no lot of ungrammatical output. And it was the burden of GB now to show that this ungrammatical output can be blocked by general principles of UG. So the second job that GB undertook was to formulate those general principles. These general principles, we can say that the child is born with knowledge of. Okay? So, and GB, the, uh, the substantial part of GB now consists of modules of principles and these are formulated as follows. The modules of UG, what are they? In, in the book Lectures on Government and Binding, Chomsky grouped them into six sub-modules. One was bounding theory, a second one was government theory, a third was 
theta theory, fourth was binding theory, a fifth was case theory, and the sixth was control theory. In this particular unit, we will look at the first two modules of UG, namely bounding theory and government. What does the bounding theory attempt to do? Bounding theory is an attempt to explain the island constraints. You will recall that in the last unit on GB, we talked about islands, this, that is certain syntactic configurations from within which it was not possible to extract a phrase. And you will also recall that we listed two such islands, namely the complex NP and WH island. And the constraint which says that these were islands, we call them the complex NP constraint and the WH island constraint. We looked at th these two constraints in some depth in the last unit. Take for example the, the, uh, the complex NP constraint. Okay, let us take them first. Uh, as you know, these are we have a question formation, relativization, etc. These are long distance rules. For example, I can s s say a sentence like, you said that John believes that Mary saw something. And instead of something, if I put what, I can move it all the way up to the beginning of the sentence. I can say, what did you say that John believes that Mary saw? What has come all the way from the object position of C? which is uh, two sentences, two clauses embedded. Okay? So, what has come from the position of the object position of C? Now, earlier we used to think of the, this long movement as one single movement. You start with the deep structure, you said that John believes that Mary saw what? and you move what to the beginning of the whole sentence and you get the sentence what did you say that John believes that Mary saw. Now what Chomsky proposed in some earlier papers and now he takes up the idea again was that in the case of a long movement of a WH phrase it does not move in one fell swoop. In fact, it must move in small steps. For example, it must move first to the uh, comp or the, the, the to the nearest comp, that is the most embedded clause. The most embedded clause here is in the sentence you said that May John believes that Mary saw what that Mary saw what is the most embedded clause. You move what to the beginning of that clause, to the composition of that clause, so you get what that Mary saw. Then you move what to the comp of the next higher clause, that is that John believes that Mary saw what, you move it to, uh, to the comp of that clause and then again to the comp of the matrix clause. So you see in the case of this deep structure you said that John believes that Mary saw what, what actually reaches its final destination in three hops, three small steps. What first moves to the comp of the most deeply embedded clause, then it moves to the comp of the intermediate clause and then it moves to the comp or the matrix clause. And Chomsky said that 
there are certain constraints on this each movement. He proposed that certain syntactic nodes were bounding nodes. The, uh, the syntactic nodes which he proposed were bounding nodes were NP and S n p and s and he said that in one movement of the w h phrase it can cross only one bounding node crossing one bounding node is permissible but if it is forced to cross two bounding nodes in one movement that results in ungrammaticality and that he said is the explanation for the island constraints. Look at the sentence, look at a simple sentence, John claimed that he saw Mary. That's a good sentence. Instead of Mary, if you put whom, John claimed, Peter claimed that he saw whom, whom can be moved. Whom did Peter uh, claim that Mary saw, that he saw? Okay. But suppose you have instead of uh, that an embedded complex noun phrase. Peter made the claim that he saw whom, and you try to move it out. Then whom can first move to the comp of the embedded clause without any problem? But when it tries to move the second movement to the comp or the matrix clause, it has to cross two bounding nodes, namely an NP and an S. Let me point them out. Peter made the claim. Okay? When it comes out of that configuration, the claim, there is an NP boundary there. And Peter made there is an S boundary there and the WH phrase has to move in one movement across two bounding nodes and this violates the constraint that one movement can cross only one bounding node. Look at WH islands. As we said, extraction is not possible out of a WH island and this is called the WH island constraint. And we also uh, saw what a WH island is. A WH island is an embedded clause which already has a WH phrase in its comp. For example, if I ask the question, you ask, uh, you say, you asked her what she showed uh, to Mary. Okay. You asked her what she showed to Mary. That's a good sentence. Now, the embedded clause has what in its composition? Now, suppose you try to move something out of that clause. For example, if you start with the deep structure, you asked her what she showed to whom and try to move out the whom. You get the sentence, whom did you ask her what she showed to? which is an extremely bad sentence. And why is it bad? Because <coughs> the, the, the embedded comp position is already occupied by a WH phrase namely what. You ask the what she showed to whom. Therefore when whom, whom starts to move out, tries to move out, it tries to take the smallest step which is the comp of the embedded clause, but it finds that that composition is already filled. Therefore, it is forced to move all the way to the matrix composition in one movement. And this movement, as you can see, crosses two S nodes. As I said earlier, the bounding nodes are S and NP. So you cannot cross two S nodes or you cannot cross one S node and one NP 
or two ANP nodes. Two bounding nodes cannot be crossed in one movement. But in this case, when you try to extract a WF phrase from within a WH island, you are forced, the WH phrase is forced to go across two bounding nodes. And that is why the WH island configuration is an, an island. Uh, so much for bounding theory. Now let us look at government theory. The notion of a verb governing its complements is actually a traditional notion which you find also in traditional grammar. Traditional grammar said that a, a verb governs its complements. For example, take the verb give. Give a book to Mary. That's the verb phrase. In this verb phrase, give governs its direct object, the book, and it also governs its indirect object, to Mary. Okay? So this is a traditional notion. But Chomsky formulated the uh, notion of government in a slightly more complicated way, which I give here. The Chomskyan defini definition of government says x governs y if and only if the following conditions are met. x is the head of a phrase. Note that only heads govern. Okay? Only heads govern. x is the head of a phrase. 2. x c commands y. This notion of C command, we are going to talk about directly. Okay? And importantly, a third condition, there should be no boundary of a maximal phrase that comes between X and Y. In a simple case like uh, give the book to Mary, give is the head of a phrase. It C commands its complements. And there is no maximal boundary that comes between the verb govern and its complements. But if you have an a embedded clause, I believe that he is clever. I believe that he, be, he is clever. Now take the matrix verb believe. It is a head of a phrase, namely the VP. This verb takes a clausal complement, an S bar, a finite clause here. I believe that he is clever. Does believe govern he, the subject of the embedded clause? It doesn't, because okay, believe is the head of a phrase. It C commands he, but in between comes the boundary of a maximal projection, namely S bar, because finite clauses are S bar and they are maximal projections. Therefore, a finite clause, uh, a finite clause boundary, a maximal projection boundary comes between the verb and he. And therefore, there is no government of the ver matrix verb into the embedded clause. But suppose instead of believe taking a finite clause as complement, it were to take a non-finite clause as its complement. For example, instead of saying I believe that he is clever, I were to say I believe him to be clever. Remember the difference. Note the difference. I believe that he is clever where that he is clever is an S bar, a maximal projection. And I believe him to be clever, where him to be clever is not an S bar, it is only an S. S is not a maximal projection. S bar is a maximal projection, S is not a maximal projection. Now does believe govern the, the subject of the embedded clause? I believe him to be clever. 
believe is the head of a phrase because it's the head of VP it C commands him all right and in between there is no maximal projection boundary because the only boundary that comes between believe and him is an S not an S bar and S is not a maximal projection therefore believe does govern him and fact believe gives him its accusative case because you note the, uh, notice the difference between a finite clause complement and a non-finite clause complement I believe that he is clever I believe that he is clever there he is nominative because it is a subject of a finite clause take this other sentence I believe him to be clever him is a subject of a non-finite clause it must get its case <coughs> from the matrix verb and the matrix verb is enabled to govern it because the configuration is right okay now let us briefly introduce you to the notion of C command when does an a, a head A C command a constituent B there are several definitions of C command which obtain in the theory but the simplest definition was also the earliest this is the definition given by Tanya Reinhardt in her, in her MIT thesis written in 1976 <coughs> Reinhardt defined C command as follows A C commands B if and only if B is not part of A that is A does not contain B and the first branching node that contains A contains B the first branching node that contains A contains B to see this you will have to draw certain trees for example think of the uh, of the subject of a clause C commanding what does it C command the subject of a clause will C command everything within the VP because the VP is not contained in the subject it's a separate thing and the first branching node above the subject is S which also contains the VP and therefore it C commands both the VP and everything within the VP this is the notion of C command which is used in the definition of government in this unit we looked at two modules of UG namely the bounding theory and the government theory the bounding theory says that NP and S NP and S are bounding nodes and one movement of a phrase can cross only one bounding node and not two bounding nodes at in one swoop and the government theory showed under what configurations for example a matrix verb can govern into an embedded clause and in what configurations it is not allowed to govern into an embedded clause thank you